Well, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. God is good. And all the time, I'm Charles Anderson, directing pastor here, and it's my privilege to share God's word, hopefully in God's way. As I have to tell you, I'm looking out and thinking, this is a pretty good attendance for a Memorial Day weekend. I'm I'm impressed with you all. Are you all just that committed to Jesus, or did the rain block all your routes out of town? (laughs) You're here, and I praise God, and I thank you for your participation. This is not only the Memorial Day weekend, this is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, when the book of Acts remembers how God sent God's Spirit on the disciples to form uh, the church. And we'll be looking at that scripture in just a moment. But I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to remind us this is the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, My father served in the Army during World War II, so I know what it's like. I understand the experience of having a veteran in one's family. My grandfather served in World War I. He lied and got into the Navy two years younger than he should have, and they just didn't check birth certificates back then. And uh, he was wounded, was shot in the stomach was hospitalized in France. So I understand the experience of those veterans, families whose veterans uh, walk with a limp, who carry the wounds of past service. But I have to tell you, I cannot understand, I cannot uh, say I know what it's like to have an absence at the Christmas table because someone lived out the word sacrifice. I cannot say that I know what it's like For there to be an empty space in the family photo. Because someone lived out the meaning of sacrifice. I cannot say that I know what it's like to grow up without a father, a mother, a sister, a brother. Because they were protecting my family by giving their lives which the family gave them. I don't know those things. What I do know is it's always good and right at this time of year for the people of God to pray like people of God for those whom we remember. So let's pray. On this Memorial Day weekend, Lord God, help us be deep enough, faithful enough, godly enough to pause amidst the vacationing and barbecues and sales and to be humbled, sobered, moved in the depths of who we are, By the memory of those who gave as your son gave. Who like your son sacrificed that we might live. Who are connected indelibly in your eternal heart. By the way they practiced Jesus-like sacrifice. And gave away their life for their friends. And the friend that is their nation. Greater love has no one than this Lord God. than they lay light on their lives for the friend. Especially when that friend is a community called the nation. So on this day, Lord God, we pray for those who sense the absence. And may our love and your Holy Spirit fill them with the comfort and the peace that passes understanding. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday. and I invite you to take your Bibles if you have them. And turn to Acts, the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 2. Select verses. Select verses from Acts chapter 2. And here in the story of Pentecost, the word of God for you. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, Because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? 
But others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And if in the words of this one we hear not the voice of God, then please speak to each of us In the quietness of our own hearts. Amen. Several years ago, Joe Kane had this dream. This um, San Francisco reporter had a dream of rafting the entire length of the Amazon River. Now, please understand, he had been born in the city. He was not what you and I would call outdoorsy. He had no understanding of rafting or the Amazon River or of jungle snakes. He didn't know a thing about Marxist guerrillas or narco traffickers or bad drinking water or paddling technique. Heck, you probably know more about paddling than Joe did. But Joe went... And he went to the headwaters of the Amazon River. It's just a little trickle of water. Begins as a little trickle of water some 17,000 feet up in the Peruvian Andes. And from there he started a half year raft journey that would take him some 4,200 miles miles. He fought insects, rapids, thousand foot gorges. He battled against terrorist bullets, insects and snakes, bad drinking water, personality clashes and fatigue. And yet at the end of six months, Joe realized his dream. He actually rafted the entire length of the Amazon River. And Joe Kane wrote a fascinating book about his experience. It's called Running the Amazon. Running the Amazon. And as you read this incredible story, it soon becomes clear Joe was not afraid to dream great dreams. He, was, he really wasn't afraid to risk great risk, and he wasn't afraid to challenge himself on the world's longest and most dangerous river. And in fact, the only way that he made it through his adventure alive was by his dreaming and by his daring. And on this Pentecost Sunday, When we talk about the power of God's Spirit, my question to you for this Pentecost Sunday is, what are you dreaming? And what are you daring? What what kind of size are you putting on your future? And is that future, is your vision of the future large enough, big enough, that it will help you get through this adventure called life alive? Because the fact of the matter is, there are some 
There are some of us who have big enough dreams that, that we're literally running the Amazon like Joe Kane. But the real truth of the matter is most of, us are, most of us are doing well just running to Walmart. That's just about the extent of the adventure we have in us. I know for myself, for instance, that too often I'm driven more by distraction than by dreams driven more by obstacles and opportunities, more by my frustrations than my future. I let my vision get stunted. I don't see the big picture. I let it get stunted and I settle for Walmart when I could have the Amazon. But how big is your dreaming? And How big is your daring? And are they large enough? Is your future large enough To get you through this adventure called life. Alive. Because on this Pentecost Sunday. The text we just read. The passage we just read. Is for people. Who are ready to dream and dare. Something more. In our story this morning from Acts. God is actually asking two questions. Asking two questions. God is actually saying two things. That will Give our lives, give our future from size. For instance, first, God says, dare to dream. Dare to dream. In other words, God's saying, live out my gift of holy imagination. Are are you living out a life that's full of some holy imagination? I once heard Chuck Swindoll say that vision... Vision is the one essential ingredient for being an original person in a world of copies. Now think about that. Vision, the ability to have holy eyesight and holy insight. Vision, the one essential ingredient for being someone original in a copycat world. Because the fact of the matter is, very rare is the person who's living passionately out of some grand and unpredictable vision, some grand and unpredictable dream. But I want to tell you what you already know, which is there is a significant difference between a life of existence and a life of excitement. A difference between a life of existence and excitement. There is a life difference between running to Walmart And running the Amazon. And that difference is a dream. It's a God dream. It's a faith vision of the future. That sees as God sees. That knows what God knows. And leads where God leads. And the fact of the matter is. If you're a Christian. Then God's made you to be a dream maker. You're meant. To be a dream maker. Which is something that the Bible understands. On Pentecost. When God sends God's spirit to form the church. The apostle Peter. Preaches the first Christian sermon ever. That's what our passage is. It's actually the first Christian sermon ever recorded. And what does Peter use As his scripture lesson is his text. What does Peter understand to be the evidence that this is of God? Well, it's from the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophet Joel. Joel chapter 2. I will pour out my vision. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And according to Peter... The evidence is not the Spirit of God. It's not just the fire of God. The real proof is the dreams of God. They are God's people because they dream God's dreams. Can the same be said of you? Can you say today that you are dreaming the dreams of God? That your life is captured? Your life is captured by a God-given faith-driven vision of the future. 
Because I frankly believe that God wants your life to be more than mere human existence. In fact, I believe he wants it to be holy excitement. God wants your life driven by a sense of holy imagination. And I also believe that God is planting a God-sized dream somewhere in your heart. Where is God planning a God-sized dream in your heart? Maybe. Maybe your dream is like Jacob of the Old Testament. Jacob in the Old Testament book of Genesis dreams of a ladder that runs from earth to heaven. Remember that old hymn, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder? Jacob dreams, and Genesis says the dream turns him from becoming a juvenile delinquent and to the founding father of an entire nation, Israel. Or maybe your dream, the Bible says, maybe the dream, your dream is like in Genesis, Joseph. Joseph of the amazing technicolor dream coat. Joseph dreams, and that dream turns him from being a Hebrew fashion statement and to the prime minister of Egypt. Or maybe your dream, says the Bible, is like Joseph of Nazareth. In Matthew's gospel, Joseph dreams. And that dream turns him from being a Sears siding installer into the foster father of God's only son. Where is God's imagination taking you? Where are you becoming a dream maker for God? Craig Rochelle's mentor once told him, Craig, you will most likely overestimate how God works through you in the short run. But you will also probably underestimate how God works through you in the long run. I think that's what Peter discovered at Pentecost. God's imagination. God's ability to dream God's dreams in you. Far exceeds your eyesight or your insight. And you and I tend to overestimate what we can do for God in the short run. But we underestimate what God can do through us in the long run. And if you're in this for the long haul, then you need to become a dream maker for God. Which is why God first says, dare to dream. Dare to dream. Live out my gift to you of holy imagination. And then God says, now dare that dream. Dare that dream. Live out my other gift of holy adventure. The gift of holy adventure. Young high school couple coming in from their second date. He's bringing her home. Second date. Walking up to her porch. He decides it's now or never time to act. He says to her, can I kiss you goodnight? She smiles at him, flutters her eyes. But says nothing. He being male. Does not understand what this means. He's confused. He's wondering what he did wrong. Suddenly he figures out what's wrong. It's a problem of grammar. So this time he says. May I kiss you. Good night. She dazzles him with her smile. Tilts her head up. Closes her eyes. Says nothing. He being male is now totally confused. And in his frustration he mutters, uh, are you deaf? She opens her eyes and she says, uh, are you paralyzed? I sometimes wonder if that's what God wants to say to us. Because just like that young man, we had the dream but we're paralyzed. We dare to dream, but we don't dare that dream. We keep questioning the dream instead of risking it. 
But risk is God's great dividing line between imagination and adventure. Now think about that. It's risk where God divides imagination from adventure. My favorite story, for instance, in the Old Testament, David and Goliath. Remember David and Goliath? Remember it goes like this. King Saul, King Saul goes out to battle. He has this great vision of victory. But then he runs into Goliath. And Saul looks at Goliath and Saul says, He's so big, I can't win. And he turns and he runs away. He runs off the battlefield. But as he's running off the battlefield, Saul sees this young shepherd boy. This young shepherd boy, running in the opposite direction, runs past him, swinging his slingshot. And Saul says, David, what are you doing? And David yells back, he's so big, I can't miss. Well, now wait a minute. Same vision, same battle, same giant. What's the difference? What's the difference between I can't win and I can't miss? Well, you know what it is, don't you? Saul dared to dream, but David dared the dream. He put himself at risk for the vision he saw. And folks, sometimes... The only difference between fantasy and faith is what you risk. Sometimes the only only difference between fantasy and faith is what you put on the line for Jesus Christ. Which is why it's not enough for you to be a dream maker. You also need to be a risk taker. You need to be a risk taker for God. Which is what Peter discovered on Pentecost. On that first Pentecost... God sends this dream maker spirit on the church. And everyone around them says, they're stinking drunk. Peter knew, you dream great dreams for God and you stand to be ridiculed. Friends and family may not understand you. Others will criticize you. In fact, the greater the dream the louder your critics. But that's why God didn't just make Peter into a dream maker. God made Peter into a risk taker. And now Peter, who less than two months before this couldn't admit to three people that he knew Jesus, now Peter stands up before 3,000 people and he puts it all on the line. And he says, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Peter takes a risk, and the world hasn't been the same since. Now, folks, if you want to live your life like you're running the Amazon, don't just be a dream maker. Be a risk taker for God. Be a risk taker. Be someone who assigns your whole life to the incredible adventure God has planned specifically for you. Because God loves no one more than a risk taker who will follow him. People may not understand you, but God will use you. After all, it's rare for 99-year-olds to leave family and friends and move thousands of miles away to have a baby and start a daycare center. But don't tell that to Sarah and Abraham. It's very rare for 80-year-old shepherds to play chicken with Moses. But don't tell Moses. And just like David with Goliath, all God is asking you to do is take your best shot to the glory of God. It's all he wants. Just take your best shot. Because then God will begin to shape you into someone like no one else. It, it is a, 
taking impossible steps for God, boy, that's a risky, giant step. But the thing is, when you dream great dreams for God, you cultivate this intimate closeness with God. And when you, when you risk great risks for God, boy, that's when you're imitating the greatest dream maker of all, Jesus Christ. When you dare to dream and then dare that dream, God's Spirit lives in you. God forms in you and gives you an imagination and an adventure beyond anything you could ever have on your own. And when you dare to dream and then dare that dream, I promise you that God's going to shape you into the most alive person of all. And that is a dream maker and a risk taker. I remember Michael Doris when he said, he inhabits my dreams. Michael was talking about his son, Abel. Some years back, Abel killed in a hit-and-run accident. And yet even now in death, Abel is still very real to his father. Uh, even now in, in death, Abel has become for his dad an oasis, a, a retreat of rest and renewal for his dad. And so Michael says, he inhabits my dreams. Who inhabits your dreams? Who can you honestly say has become your dream dweller? Because I want to tell you, in the expanse between fantasy and faith, the Spirit of God is calling you. In the area between what is and what could be, the Spirit of Christ has a vision for you that He wants you to try on for size. And in the expanse between the impossible and the incredible, the Holy Spirit has a dream of what you can do and what only you can do for God. And so on, the, on this Pentecost Sunday, by God, be a dream maker. And by that same God, be a risk taker. Dare to dream something for God. And then dare that dream. Let Jesus Christ be your dream dweller and let God's Spirit live out that incredible adventure that He has just for you.